Welcome back to Curve Lab. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I made a super realistic, one-tenth scale, 3D printable RC Porsche. And the best part is I have 3D files available and instructions if you wanna build one at home. Everything is available for download on curvelab.com. All right, let's jump into the video. For this project, the chassis I'm using is a Tamiya TTO2. I think it's the perfect chassis for this project because it's versatile, there's a bunch of aftermarket parts available online, and it's relatively affordable and easy to build. Also, the wheelbase for this chassis is a really good match to the 930 Turbo. And I'm lucky enough that someone on the internet has 3D scanned this chassis before, so I was able to download a mesh file of the scan. Using this scan as an underlay, I started to build the body in Autodesk Alias. Alias is a surface modeling program that is really optimized for building these complex automotive exteriors. Surface modeling the whole car is extremely time consuming, but it's necessary because I need clean parametric surfaces that can be manipulated, offset, thickened, and otherwise edited to create features and to hone in the design of each part to be 3D printed. And that's just not something you can do with a mesh file. I could make a whole two or three hour video talking just about the process of building the surface and alias, but I think that's not very interesting to most people, so I'm going to skip ahead about 60 hours to the fun stuff. So here's the finished alias surface model and I can move on to reverse engineering the chassis. And this process was made a whole lot easier this time around given that I had access to a 3D scan. So I could get away with doing a lot fewer measurements by hand. So you might ask why build the whole assembly in SolidWorks if I have a 3D scan already, but the chassis is not static. You know, it has suspension, it has steering, and that kind of detail matters for designing around a functional RC car. So at this point, I imported the alias model into SolidWorks to thicken all the parts, and you can see the pink layer here is sort of an inner substrate that all the body panels will attach to and this substrate is gonna attach back to the chassis. So the entire body will be able to lift on and off of the chassis like a typical RC car shell. In order to be able to print this inner substrate, I have to split it into two separate parts to fit on a build plate, which can later be glued together. You can see those parts here in pink and teal. So this is the very first iteration of this main substrate that's split into two pieces to be printed on the Bamboo Lab. I want to use this single substrate for all the body panels to attach to because it'll pull them all into alignment. But since I have to break them in half to fit on the build plate, they need to be glued together after printing. I'm using super glue, uh, two different viscosities, thick and thin, and I have a link for these in the description of this video. For gluing these two halves of the substrate together, I recommend using the thick viscosity because it dries a little bit slower and it gives you a chance to align the parts perfectly before for freezing up. In version two of the substrate, I'm adding these little diamond shape alignment features for all of the body panels. This makes locating all of the body panels and snapping them onto the substrate while you're gluing extremely easy and the diamond shape is a 45 degree overhang so it can be printed without the use of support. So I finished designing all the parts of the body in SolidWorks and I wanna do a first test assembly before doing any sanding or painting and just make sure that all the printed parts assemble together without issue. I spent a lot of time making sure that parts that could be printed without support were designed to print without support because it means the parts can print a lot faster and they're generally a lot higher quality when you don't need to use support. The green part shown here is the bracket that connects the substrate and all the body panels to the chassis. And to ensure that it's installed with perfect alignment, there are these little ribs that sort of notch and hold the bracket in place while you're gluing. The rear bracket to substrate part is similar to the front one. There are features designed in to hold it in place while you glue, and it prints super quickly without the use of support. The substrate has features and ribs designed into it that pull the wheel well into alignment, so it's just a matter of dabbing some glue and holding the well in place while it dries. And if you're impatient like I am, I just hit it with a little bit of zip kicker to speed up the process. This stuff is a must have because it just instantly cures the super glue so you don't have to hold parts in a precarious position while they dry. So I wanted to just do a test fit and make sure the substrate and these brackets align and don't impede the steering or the suspension travel of the vehicle. And I'm pretty happy with the results. So I'm moving on to printing some of the body panels to test their fit onto the substrate. I added a flat plane at the base of the hood that allows it to print vertically with very little use of support. And I'm super happy with the way the hood comes out every single time I print it because of this feature. 
So I'm experimenting with printing some of the body panels in ways that minimize the amount of support required. And you can hear the little diamond shape alignment features at work here as they click into place. It's really satisfying and it reassures me that when I'm gluing the parts on, they're, they're perfectly aligned where they need to be. The front fender is a part that I experimented with a lot in the best orientation to print it. This ended up being not the greatest orientation. I got a lot of wood grain that requires more sanding before paint. But for this prototype build where I'm not gonna paint, it's not an issue. I'll show you how I fix this issue in the next revision. So this is the whole body all glued up. And you can see it lifts on and off just like a normal RC car body. The insulation is super easy. It's just aligning these four pegs and we keep the full range of the Tamiya chassis suspension travel. So I learned a bunch of valuable things from this prototype build. Number one is on a real 930 turbo, the rear fender is connected seamlessly to the roof rail and to the roof. Um, but in order to print these more easily, I, I chopped them up. But looking at how these parts assemble to the substrate, it's gonna leave seams where the parts have to glue together. And I'm just worried about the amount of sanding it's gonna take to massage out those seams. So I realized there's a much better way to do that, which is just combine those outer body panels shown here in pink, with the substrate as a single body. And then that single body can be painted with body color. And this maintains all the real part gaps from reality and means you don't have to spend a bunch of time sanding out these glue seams. And it doesn't change the fact that these substrate pieces can be printed without support. So it's a win-win. I made a bunch of other edits based on what I learned from this prototype build. Things like tuning the fit between these interlocking mechanical features. And I edited the way some parts were designed to make them print a little bit better. And ultimately just made a lot of refinements to DFM and DFA, or design for manufacture and design for assembly. So I'm feeling really good about the next version. The beauty of carefully designed parts is that they are designed to print, which means they print quickly, which means you can do a bunch of quick iteration and really tune the design without having to worry about printing for days. So I think this is a philosophy I'm gonna employ going forward is spend all the time up front in your design process designing parts to print. It just saves so much hassle later on when it comes to finishing and sanding parts. The entire project can be printed in eight build plates. And, and to be honest, I didn't even pack it in there. I think if you pack the parts in there, you could probably get it down to five or six build plates. I can confidently say I found the optimal orientation for printing these fender pieces. It requires a little bit of support, but shockingly little considering how complex the part is. And it leaves all the areas on the fender that really are gonna show the most gloss and highlight and highlight any imperfections. It leaves them with perfect layer lines. On a lot of these front and rear bumper parts, I opted for using support just because splitting it in half down the middle and printing as two separate parts, again, brings that issue of sanding out a glue seam. And it leaves almost no sanding or finishing at the end. I've seen a lot of 3D printable car models that combine a lot of these little trim parts into larger parts or into the main body. And I just think the way to achieve the best realism is to be able to paint these parts separately. The grill from the whale tail printed beautifully on the bamboo lab, but there are these little microscopic hairs left over between all the louvers. And I found using a butane torch or even a, a lighter if you have one, works really well for melting away these hairs. So with the raw prints, the only sanding I'm doing before going to paint is kind of deburring all the edges and sanding away any of the little tiny pieces of spaghetti or things that spray paint won't really cover up. My new philosophy is that you don't really want to spend a bunch of time sanding plastic because after it's printed, you have these microscopic layer lines that look like this in cross section. And so right after printing, I find you should just go straight to painting so that a layer of spray paint shown here in orange fills in these little valleys between each layer line. And this means you get away with sanding a lot less of the plastic because sanding down these plastic mountaintops all the way down to the base of the valley would take a huge amount of time. I found the best primer for painting 3D prints is a two-in-one sandable filler. You can start with a really aggressively thick coat since you're gonna do a rough sand right off the bat.
The other good thing about this paint is it dries super quickly, so I found that I could start sanding like an hour after painting. But the first order of business is filling in this glue seam with Bondo. I use a credit card to sort of roughly apply and smooth in the Bondo over the glue seam. Here I'm dealing with an issue of flushness between the two parts. So the goal is to build up Bondo on the side that's under flush. And you want to smear the Bondo out far enough that you can come back and level it while sanding the least amount of plastic possible. In the first iteration, I had a bunch of issues with windows warping. I think it's because they're really tall and thin parts to print, and when they cool off after printing, they just sort of warp. So the solution I found was creating a larger footprint while it prints to stabilize the part, and adding little ribs to add more material and more stiffness. I did all the sanding with wet-dry sanding pads that I got on Amazon. I started with 220 grit and went down to 320 grit. For the most part, I wet sanded just to manage some of the dust in my studio space. And wet sanding helps keep the grit clean, so you don't really have to replace the piece of sanding foam at any point. After Bondo and Rough Sand, I follow up with one more coat of sandable filler just to make sure all the surfaces are the same material and consistent in finish before going to base coat. For all of the black trim on the car, I'm using this trim and bumper paint from Rust-Oleum. It has that exact right sort of satin finish that you see from 70s and 80s molded trim parts. And now that I'm moving on to base coat, I decided to move into the workshop because last time I did this on the Tacoma project, painting outside caused a bunch of issues because while the paint was drying, pollen kind of drifted onto the surface and then following up with clear coat just locked in those defects. So I'm hoping to avoid that this time around. The trade-off I discovered though is that I end up painting everything in my workshop with metallic flake paint. I even painted my camera lens a little bit. So I guess ultimately you're gonna have to decide whether you want pollen in your paint or to paint everything in your house. So the base coat I ended up using is an ERA Paints Crystal Silver Metallic, which is an official Porsche paint code. And it comes with a clear coat that's compatible with the base coat. And I ended up using just one can of base coat and one can of clear. I followed ERA's recommendations for application of the clear coat. I did two light layers separated by 10 minutes, and then one third layer that is a bit heavier. And then I let the paint set up for three or four days. You really want to make sure it's fully cured before you start polishing it with the polishing compound. After I was done polishing all the painted parts, it's ready for final assembly. So quickly before I get into the final assembly, if you want step-by-step -step instructions, you can find them at curvelab.com. Click on the 930 project and scroll down to build guide. And here I have a list of all the paints and materials and tools that I used. And the build guide covers things like the print settings and the painting process and a step-by-step -step instruction manual for assembly. So if you get stuck anywhere in the build, make sure to reference the build guide. Okay, back to final assembly. Most of the steps of the process are self-explanatory. You print out a part, it has some features, and those features fit perfectly into the substrate. However, now that you've gone to all this trouble of painting and finishing the parts, you want to be extremely careful with super glue. Basically, you want to make sure that the only surfaces that the glue touches are on the B side, not the outward facing A side. So I got ultra thin super glue, which allows me to very precisely apply where I need the adhesive using the pipette tip. For glue ups that don't require precision, you can feel free to use a regular super glue.
So I ordered Tamiya's LED light kit to add headlights and taillights to this model. The kit couldn't be simpler to install. It's just two connectors that splice between the battery cable and the ECU. And the unit has ports to add more lights if you have any other running lights. And you can mount it pretty much anywhere under the body with double stick tape. The LEDs are a standard size. So the headlight casing I designed should be able to accommodate most standard LEDs. The LED can insert into the rear of the headlight casing, and then a small cap follows that and locks the LED into place using two M3 fasteners and threaded inserts. So you can easily replace or swap out the LEDs at any point. The last piece to the headlight assembly is the clear outer lens, and I haven't had much success printing clear filament on an FDM printer, so I sent out for SLA resin prints. If you don't have access to a resin printer, clear filament will work just fine, it just won't be 100% optically clear. But since I am going for 100% optically clear, I'm going to take these lenses through a full range of grits, starting at 500 all the way up through 2500. Similarly to the headlights, the rear tail bar could easily be FDM printed with transparent red filament, but it wouldn't be 100% transparent. So again, I sent out for parts. So looking back on this project, it went so much quicker than the Tacoma build, if, if you're familiar with my previous project. It went quicker because I designed the parts more intelligently. Therefore, I spent a lot less time needing to sand and finish the parts. And the second the glue dried, I took it out for a test drive. If you want to 3D print one yourself, all the files and in-depth instructions are available on curvelab.com.